The story opens in the Bakumatsu era in 17th century Japan. It is the time when the military government of the Edo period is slowly coming to an end. Japan is moving away from the isolationist totalitarian government under the influence of the United States. Obviously not everyone is in support of this change, especially the low-level samurais. Takechi Hanpeta of Tosa province is one such samurai who still wants to keep Japan closed for outsiders. He wants to overthrow the ruling military government and establish a rule under the monarchy. Unfortunately, his actions are deemed to be illegal and there is only one punishment for such crimes. Seppuku. One night, Takechi is taken to the Kochi castle where he is supposed to end his life as a punishment for rebelling against the government. His wife runs to the castle's gates but is not allowed to go further. She screams for her husband but inside, Takechi bravely prepares to embrace his fate. Just as he takes off his gown and is about to plunge a knife into his abdomen, something really strange happens. He is knocked out cold and the scene fades to black. When Takechi regains his consciousness, he is lying in the middle of a road in modern-day Japan. The samurai has somehow been transported around 150 years into the future and is now in the village of Kamisato. Before Takechi can make sense of where he is, a car approaches him at speed. He manages to dodge the vehicle thanks to his lightning-fast reactions. However, the samurai has never seen anything move at such a speed and wonders if the car is some kind of a monster. Seconds later, a local man named Toranosuke Seiki and his girlfriend disembark from the vehicle. They are angry that a strange man, cosplaying as a samurai, decided to appear in front of their car. Takechi, on the other hand, is baffled by their modern clothes and colored hair. He also speaks old Japanese, which is slightly different from the one that they converse in. When they tell him that he is still in Japan, Takechi begins to laugh. He thinks that his fellow soldiers sneaked him out of Kochi Castle before his seppuku. The couple is disturbed at this stranger laughing hysterically and decides to drive away immediately. Takechi watches their car leave and decides to head back to his home in Tosa on foot. In the same village, Haruka Seiki is out on a door-to-door -door visit with a local council member, Kichi Komiyama. They visit homes of elderly people where Kichi pretends to care about their issues. He makes his assistant, Haruka, do household tasks at their homes. Thanks to his buttery talks and Haruka's free labor, he manages to convince a few people to vote for him in the upcoming council elections. Behind the scenes, he is actually a pervert who only cares about himself. While they are getting ready to go to another home in the community, Kichi gets a call from the local supermarket. He is told that there is a man, dressed as a samurai, causing public nuisance there. The scene shifts to the supermarket where Takechi is examining various fruits which he has never seen in his life. The staff watch him intently as he has been wandering around the store for quite a while now. To them, it appears as if he is some cosplaying bum who is looking for a chance to steal something. In reality, Takechi is not just baffled by the variety of food available but also the clothing of people in the store. He internally thinks that this part of Japan has been conquered by Western culture. Shortly afterwards, he sees a free sample stall where a woman is preparing some noodles. He recognizes them to be traditional Japanese soba noodles but cannot wrap his head around how it is being cooked. The woman then offers him a plate and Takechi reluctantly takes it. But when he tries it, the dish absolutely blows his mind. He proceeds to empty the entire plate within seconds. Haruka and Kichi, who arrived a few moments ago, watch the stranger intently. Just then, the free sample stall owner adds ginger radish pickle on Takechi's plate and he gulps down a large chunk of it. Unlike the last time, he immediately spits out the food as it is too spicy for his ancient palate. He stumbles forward and accidentally steps on a packet of instant noodles. A shop assistant then rushes towards the spot, asking if everything is okay. However, Takechi, whose mouth is on fire, bolts away from the supermarket. After running for a few meters, the samurai reaches a children's park. He freezes on the spot after seeing all the playing structures there. Seconds later, Haruka also reaches the park with a cop. The policeman asks Takechi to come with him but the latter notices the pistol in his waist. Suspicious, the samurai springs into action once more and runs away from his pursuers. Haruka is surprised just how quickly this stranger sprints despite wearing traditional clothes. On the other hand, Takechi continues to run full blast for several kilometers until he is left with no energy. He eventually collapses on the road near a primary school. Moments later, a group of children from the school notice him laying face first and immediately call their teacher, Mr. Makoto Saeki. He is an old kind man who picks up the stranger and takes him home. In the meantime, the news of a suspicious stranger dressed as a samurai spreads around the village. The local council also asks people to report to the police if they see such a figure. Despite this, Mr. Makoto allows the stranger to recover in his home. Later that evening, Haruka and Toranosuke both come home. 
it is revealed that they are Mr. Makoto's grandchildren and live with the old man. To their surprise, they find the stranger dressed as a samurai in one of the rooms. The siblings are about to call the police when their grandfather intervenes. He tells them that he found the stranger lying unconscious near the school. The old man persuades them not to inform the authorities and asks everyone to sit down for dinner. While they are eating, Takechi gets incredibly emotional because of the kindness that the old man has shown. He is a stranger and yet Mr. Makoto has given him a place to live as well as food. The samurai feels indebted towards the old man and promises to pay it with his life. Meanwhile, the Seiki siblings think that the stranger is simply putting up an act to swindle their kind-hearted grandfather. As the conversation keeps going on, Takechi reveals a little about his past. He tells them how he was supposed to commit Harakiri for a crime he committed. He still thinks that his comrade somehow sneaked him away from Tawa and dumped him in this strange city. The samurai doesn't realize that he has been transported into the future. So Mr. Makoto brings out a history book and shows Takechi all the periods that have passed by since he was born. The old man tells the samurai that he is now 150 years in the future. Obviously the latter thinks it is a joke and laughs it off. But when Makoto shows him the television, the samurai is left speechless by the technology. He finally begins to realize that he is not actually in his own time period. That entire night, Takechi spends time watching television. He is extremely disturbed as to how and why he has been plucked away from his time. In the meantime, at a local bar, the residents of the village watch breaking news on TV. It is about a serial killer who has ended at least two people in Tokyo and is currently on the run. Unbeknownst to these poor people, the killer is headed to their village of Kamisato. The following morning, the Seiki family gets ready for breakfast. But when Toronosuke goes to call the samurai, he finds the guest room empty. He informs everyone and they find a letter addressed to Mr. Makoto on the bed. In it, Takechi thanks the old man but says he is leaving their home to find a way to get back to his own time. However, Mr. Makoto is not willing to let their guest wander off on his own. So the entire Seki family goes out to look for Takechi. Thankfully, it doesn't take them long to find him. The samurai is laying down on the exact same road where he first spawned a day ago. A depressed Takechi wishes that the time rip which led him to this future timeline would swallow him back. But, Mr. Makoto encourages him to have hope and stay with him until they can find a way to send him back. With no other option, Takechi accepts the proposal. With things sorted out for the time being, Mr. Makoto starts assimilating the samurai in modern day-to-day -day life. They first head to the local supermarket where Takechi had stepped on a few packets of instant noodles. Mr. Makoto apologizes for the trouble and pays for the damages out of his own pocket. This act of generosity makes Takechi respect the old man even more. Next, Mr. Makoto also gives Takechi the responsibility to teach the primary school kids. He is sure that the samurai will instill discipline and a sense of honor among the young kids. Unlike the adults, most of the kids believe Takechi is actually a samurai. They love being around him because of his traditional clothing and eccentric hairstyle. One afternoon, Takechi notices two boys, Miko and Kento, using their mobile phones in the class. He tells them not to bring such devices in school as it disturbs the other students too. But, they dismiss his suggestion and continue being engrossed in their screens. This forces the samurai to suspend them from the class, a decision that the two boys are more than happy to oblige with. They pack their bags, loudly exclaiming that they will head to their secret hideout behind the convenience store. In the meantime, the villagers attend a meeting at the local town hall. There, a council member reveals that the serial murderer from Tokyo had recently been seen near the village's train station. This news produces a shockwave among the people attending the meeting. Their attention soon turns to Mr. Makoto who is also present there. They ask him who is currently looking after the kids in the school if he is present here. The old man decides to tell them the truth and says that he has left the kids under Takechi's guardianship. All of a sudden, the whole town hall gasps in fear. They do not trust the stranger at all and many parents immediately rush towards the school. However, when they arrive at their destination, they see that the kids are learning sumo wrestling from Takechi. Many parents are relieved but a few of them complain about their kids being covered in dirt. On the other hand, the parents of Miko and Kento cannot find their sons anywhere near. Takichi informs them that he had suspended them from the class for using mobile phones. The parents thus rush back home only to see that neither of the two boys have come back. With the rumors of a serial killer being in town, the situation soon descends into chaos. The scene shifts to the nearby forest where Miko and Kento have made it to an abandoned cottage. Unfortunately for them, the killer from Tokyo is also hiding there. He lures the two boys in, promising to show them some awesome board games. The poor kids fall for the trap and the killer eventually ties them with a rope. Back in the school, 
Kichi is having a conversation with Mr. Makoto about the possible whereabouts of the kids. While they are talking, Takechi suddenly remembers what one of the boys had exclaimed before leaving the class. They were heading to a secret hideout behind the convenience store. The samurai then quickly informs both Haruka and Toranosuke about this. Following this, Takechi and the Seiki siblings head towards the edge of the forest to look for the kids. The samurai feels guilty for this situation and rushes forward, deep into the woods. He is extremely agile and quickly scans through a large surrounding area. Shortly afterwards, he sees a cottage in the distance and runs towards it. Inside the cottage, the psychotic killer has tied and gagged the two little boys. He is about to end one of them for good when the door bursts open. In comes Takechi, the samurai from the 17th century, with unadulterated rage in his eyes. Moments later, both Haruka and Toronosuke also arrive at the cottage. They are shocked to see the two kids tied while the killer stands above them with a sharp knife. He warns them not to take a step forward or else he will kill the kids. The criminal then demands that they immediately give him their mobile phones. Frightened, the siblings oblige and throw their phones towards him. They also explain that Takechi, who is dressed in traditional attire, doesn't own a mobile phone. This irritates the killer who obviously thinks that they are trying to clown him. Seeing the seriousness of the matter, Takechi directly addresses the criminal. The samurai is no stranger to violence and wants to know why he has captured the kids. It is then revealed that the killer traveled all the way to this village just to stay away from the police. He was hiding in this cottage when suddenly the kids entered and saw him. This left him no option but to abduct the two boys. Furthermore, the criminal adds that he had killed his boss back in Tokyo. He was fed up with his life in the corporate world where everything was monotonous and meaningless. This ideology of fighting against the status quo resonates with Takichi. The samurai too had rebelled against his government in the 17th century. So he is quite pleased to see someone with the same mentality in modern day Japan. He praises the criminal but suggests not to involve kids in such matters. However, the criminal dismisses this idea of fighting against power. He replies that he killed his boss simply because he needed some thrill in his life. Takechi is disgusted by this revelation and begins hurling insults at the killer. The samurai then picks up a nearby metal rod and goads the criminal into attacking him. The killer falls for it and soon lunges forward with a knife in his hand. However, he is no match for the samurai who knocks out the criminal with relative ease. In the aftermath of this short-lived battle, Toronosuke ties up the killer and Haruka calls the police. The samurai frees the two boys who are clearly shaken by the event. The kids apologize for their rude behavior and embrace Takechi. Like a true warrior, he tells them that it is the duty of adults to protect little children. While they wait for the police to arrive, Haruka expresses her gratitude towards Takechi. She says that if it weren't for him the kids would have surely died. This statement suddenly lights a bulb in Takechi's head. He realizes that maybe he was thrown into this timeline so that he could save these two kids. Now that his duty is over, he might be able to go back home. Takechi is so sure of this theory that he even shares it with Haruka and Toranosuke. The siblings, however, are tired of his time-jumping story and dismiss his talk. They tell him that the police will soon arrive at the scene and question them about the whole incident. But Takechi is already busy dreaming about going back home. He tells the Seiki siblings to take the credit for capturing the criminal and bolts out of the cottage. Soon, he reaches the same road where he first spawned in this timeline. He then lies down on the exact spot, hoping that a time rip will pull him back in his era. In the meantime, the police arrive at the cottage and take everyone for questioning. The Seiki siblings lie about the whole event and say that they found the criminal unconscious. The two little boys also refuse to say anything about the identity of the man who saved them. This whole affair becomes a huge news in the local as well as national papers. The following morning, Kichi visits the Seki household for a casual conversation. Turns out that he had managed to take a photo of him kneeling near the unconscious body of the serial killer. The clever politician then uploaded the photo to the local council's website. This gives an impression that it was Kichi who captured the killer. Although Haruka isn't too bothered by her boss's fake story, she does tell him the truth. She admits that it was Takechi who whooped the killer and then went missing shortly afterwards. Despite this revelation, Kichi isn't too bothered by the truth. He knows that nobody would believe the story about a samurai from the past saving the lives of two kids from a killer. Elsewhere in Tokyo, a journalist named Sakamoto Ryoma shows particular interest in this story. He is hell-bent on going to the village of Kamisato and finding out more about this mysterious hero. It is obvious that he has some connection with Takichi. The following day, Haruka goes on a hunt to find Takichi. She reaches the same road where she and her father had found him laying down a few days ago. But there is no one around and gradually a thought seeps into her mind. She begins to entertain that maybe Takechi actually was a samurai from the past. And now, 
he has vanished from the present day and gone back to his era. A few minutes later, Toranosuke also arrives on the spot. The two siblings then head to a local bar which is run by their mutual friend, Ryo Shinohara. They sit down for a cup of oolong tea and discuss the events of last night. To their utter surprise, Takechi soon greets the siblings and hands them their tea. He is wearing an apron, making it clear that he is currently working in the bar. It is then revealed that last night he laid down on the road where he first spawned for quite a long time. But instead of being taken back to his era, Takechi almost got run over by a car. The person who was driving the vehicle was none other than Ryo. Seeing the stranger out in the open road like that, Ryo allowed him to sleep in her car for the night. The samurai is now working at her bar to pay that gesture of kindness. While they are having this conversation, Kichi arrives at the bar along with a journalist named Sakamoto. Haruka quickly hides Takechi who sneaks upstairs where Ryo lives with her daughter. The samurai has no intention of being famous and wants to avoid the media at all cost. On the other hand, Sakamoto is extremely keen on knowing about the enigmatic hero in this village. He has heard rumors about a person cosplaying as a samurai and wants to see him personally. But, Haruka lies and says she has no idea who the person is. A few days later, more journalists arrive in the village to cover this story about a mysterious hero who saved the lives of two kids from a murderer. Councilman Kichi plans to use this opportunity to further his own political career. So he organizes a press conference where he plans to brief the media about the incident. He even orders Haruka to be dressed as a mascot for the event. But, the latter doesn't want to do it so she convinces Takechi to be dressed as the mascot. During the press conference, the sly Kichi shows the photo of him standing near the unconscious body of the serial killer. He doesn't outright take the credit for saving the kids. But he purposely spreads the rumor that he indeed is the mysterious hero. Takechi, who is standing on the stage dressed as a mascot, doesn't seem to mind this fake narrative. After the event is over, Takechi notices how Kichi continuously pats Haruka's buttocks against her wishes. The samurai sees this as a grave crime and plans to punish the pervert old man. Late that night, Takechi arrives at the council office with a steel mop. He screams for Kichi to come out and face his punishment. The councilman, who is hiding in his office, immediately calls Haruka for backup. He urges her to come to the office as soon as possible. When Haruka eventually arrives at the spot, she sees that Takechi is about to whack Kichi's head with the steel mop. The samurai is incensed that the old man touches his employees without their consent. These kinds of incidents where a superior took advantage of their power to gain physical favors from their juniors were very commonplace in feudal Japan. Takechi was and still is vehemently against such practices. In fact, he thinks such incidents should be punishable by death. Fortunately for Kichi, Haruka stops the samurai from carrying out his own brand of justice. She tells her boss to go to his home and then calms down Takechi. By this point, it is obvious that she is slowly beginning to develop feelings for him. Following this event, Takichi heads back to the Seki household. Mr. Makoto even convinces him to return to the primary school as a teacher. Everything seems to be returning back to normal when one night, Takechi sees the journalist Sakamoto spying on him. He confronts Sakamoto but the latter doesn't seem to back down from the challenge. It is obvious that he is not just a simple journalist. Subscribe, turn on notifications, and leave 1000 likes or 100 comments for part 2. Thank you.